My name is Scott. I want to welcome you to Cross Church. Uh, you came at a good time. We are in the middle of arguably, and I'll argue with you, this is the best sermon ever given. But we're not going to argue that this is the best sermon giver. Yes? If you're going to argue with that, sorry, you're going to have a lot of people to argue with. So if you want to take this time to turn to Matthew chapter 5, um, Matthew chapter 5. So recently I was reading a book to my kids. Um, does anybody remember where the red fern grows? Yeah, like I believe it was set in the early 1900s. And there was a part where the little boy, his mom sent him down to the store with a list. And she said, hey, you know, get these things. Just give this to the, to the person they're working. So, you know, he did. He came away with the stuff. No, no money was exchanged. Nothing was, you know, it was just here's the list. They knew it was from. It was like a trust thing, right? Like, oh, we'll, 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 we'll settle this later kind of thing. You know, it was trust. And like now I'm thinking to myself, if I were to send my kids down to like Safeway, I'd probably get a call from the cops if they're like, ah, like you're trying to leave with this stuff. I'm like, yeah, but like, it's what we do. And they go, oh, we don't do that anymore, right? Like there's, a, there's not that trust factor has kind of gone out the window. So, you know, it reminded me of something. Remember, like we, we used to say things in our culture of the, a man's word is his bond, yeah? Or like what, you know, it's kind of going away or it has gone away now is a thing called a handshake. We don't really shake hands anymore. But normally when you made agreements with people, you shook hands. I know I shook hands like when I purchased cars or, you know, like a house. Like, you know, I was like, hey, you know, they seal the deal, right? But even though you've got like a stack of papers, you need to sign your life away. I'll gladly give my firstborn, you know, whatever. But, you know, the handshake was still a part of that. But before the handshake, right, it was a greeting or it was also, you know, a way to agree on things to hold your word, right? But... It also was built on that person's character, yes? Because if this person was a known liar or they always backed out of deals, people wouldn't enter into that handshake agreement with them, right? Yeah, I mean, it's just the way her culture has evolved out of those things. And it's kind of sad, actually. But anyways, um, this I was looking at, I was actually doing some research on the handshake, believe it or not. It was interesting. Uh, there was this uh, event called the Great Handshake Agreement of 1932, and it was between the Yakima Indian Tribe and the uh, uh, National Forest Service. And all they did was shake hands, and the National Forest Service says, hey, we won't do anything with this land. We'll maintain it for these berries that the Indians had grown on there. And I was like, man, that's really cool. And all they did was shake hands. And I believe it is still in place to this day, but based on a handshake, yeah? So... Man, like, I know we can't shake hands anymore. Will we fist bump now or kind of throw the elbow? Yeah, but it, maybe it doesn't mean as much as it used to. So uh, hopefully you're, you, you're looking through ch uh, Matthew chapter 5, but I want to ask you something. And you know what? To be, I'm going to be transparent with you all today. Uh, today is about honesty. It is. And I want you to search your hearts as I go through this material and really see where your honesty level is. Because I was in a meeting recently, and the question was asked, on a, on a level, on a scale of 1 to 10, how honest are you? Of course, no one answered right away, and we were all waiting for the one person to go, ah, I'm 10 out of 10 honest, and we're like, oh, you're a liar, you know? I get no way. So search your heart, though, and see, on a scale of 1 to 10, how honest are you? A lot of us, I think a popular consensus would have what, like a 7 or 8, right? Like we, we came around like a 7 or an 8 honesty, you know? I think as Christians, we try to be as honest as we can, but we have to realize what lies in that 2 to 3, yes? And, and God confronts you in that 2 to 3. Okay, so it, what lies in that two to three might be like, you might be lying to yourself, or you might not know, or, you know, you're afraid, fear, all these things of keeping you from being open and honest. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a Dave graciously lets me lead sometimes and celebrate recovery, and when I go through the lessons, I try to be transparent and honest about how they apply to my life, and I try to share life stories with me because, I'm, let me tell you something, I'm not perfect. I am nowhere near perfect. I won't be perfect until I see Jesus face to face, and I know this, but man, I can strive for perfection, but you know what? To be transparent and to show people that you're broken as well, man, there's so much healing in that for other people to see that, yes? So you have to recognize what's in your two to three. What's God confronting you in that? Because let me tell you something, and I know I say this a lot, but God, you have no choice in the matter. If you have a relationship with God, you are 10 out of 10 honest with him, even if you're trying to hide. Adam and Eve, they tried to hide behind a tree, didn't they? Right? Like, they had, like where are you? Like, what, who told you this? Right? Like, you can't hide from God. So you have no choice but to be 10 out of 10 honest with God 
but why can't we do that with other brothers and sisters or you know, believers in Christ? Like what, what's keeping us from, from being that honest? And, and the part that I usually say a lot of times to people is God knows the you that only you know, right? You're sitting there with your thoughts, probably developing some, some actions or some making some decisions, and some of them are pretty dark, and maybe you don't want to know, and be like, man, I don't want to act on that because I don't know how that thought even came into my mind, right? Like, we all have that in our going on in us, and yet God knows that side of you, yes? Like, I think, again, I'm asking y'all to be honest, so it's just, hey, I'll, I'll be the honest one up here for y'all, so if you want to, you want to amen, that's fine. If you don't, hey, I know, just, just don't be lying in here, all right? Don't be lying in God's house. So, uh, God confronts you in your two, right? Or your, your, your two and three. And uh, <laughs> I really wasn't going to share this, but I used to be a one or a two. And my mom's here, and you can ask her this story afterwards. I'm putting her on the spot. <laughs> so I remember a time, and man, God really hit me with this one when I was, when I was coming up with this sermon. I remember a time where I, uh, a couple streets over, I broke this people's window. <laughs> I threw a rock right through this sucker, all right? I was bad, all right? I'm just telling you right now I'm bad. Uh, I, was, I was bad until till Jesus said, dude, you don't have to do that anymore. Uh, anyway, so I, I and, and my friend had ratted me out. And so the, the gentleman that lived there, he came to my house, and he was asking my mom. I remember this because it was, it was bad. And I kept lying, you know? I kept saying, man, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. Everybody else knew I did. You know what I mean? Who was I lying to? I was lying to myself, and I was trying to lie to these people, but they're all looking at me like, yeah, you did, but... You know, so I was a one or a two. I'll admit it all day I was a one and a two. But God confronted me in my eight and nine. That's a lot to go through in life, yeah? And I'm one of the ones that said I'm, I'm probably seven or eight. Did I give it an eight? I think it was an eight, right? So, yeah, that's a long way, don't you think? Coming from a one, like, man, I, I'm doing good, right? But <laughs> God's working on me, still working on me, though. So <laughs> if you are in, uh, and you, uh, hopefully some of y'all asked my mom about that because, uh, yeah, God has really changed my life. I believe, right? God has really changed my life around to do some really great things in me. So, and we're going to pick up in Matthew chapter 5 uh, at verse 33. And, you know, the Bible says to do nothing out of selfish, selfish ambition, okay? So, uh, Matthew five thirty-three. again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is the footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Look at Jesus, and if you really study this sermon, again, Jesus is assaulting your heart, okay? And he loves to use the Pharisees as an example throughout, I think, most of Jesus' ministry, right? But especially in this sermon, he definitely points out the Pharisees and what the way they're doing it wrong is the example for us, okay? So, the, the, the Pharisees had developed this system of bending God's word around their life rather than molding their life around God's word, right? Like, we know, we should know better that that's not going to work. Trying to fit God's life, word in our life to try to go, oh, well, there's these rules of I just do this and that. Like, look, here, this is a perfect, these are, these are two perfect examples. Leviticus 19.12, it says, you shall not swear by my name falsely, okay? You shall not swear by my name falsely. The Pharisees used to go, used to go okay, well, I'll swear and I'll make an oath, but maybe I just, you know, I won't use God. Like, I'll use my auntie or, uh, you know, like somebody else or like, you know, like some, some kind of friend. Like, oh, I swear by so-and-so. You know, like, I'm at my, you ever hear somebody say, I swear on my mama's life. You ever hear somebody say that? Like, man, that's, that's probably not good because maybe you're already lying to begin with and then you're swearing on your mom's life. But they used to do stuff like that. Like, as long as I don't, that's just how they viewed the scripture was if you don't swear by God's name, then we can break this oath that we have, okay? Here's another example. Uh, Numbers 30, uh, uh, verse 2. It says, When a man makes a vow to Jehovah or swears an oath, he shall not break his word. Okay, so you can read this two ways, okay? And you tell me uh, which way, you know, you think. It's, uh, the one is you can go, when a man makes a vow to Jehovah, okay? That's keeping the rule, yes? Like, okay, if I make a vow to Jehovah, like... As long as I don't make a vow to Jehovah, right, like I won't have to keep my word. That's the way they were looking at it. Or they can look at it and go, um, 
He shall not break his word. That's the emphasis of the whole thing, right? He shall not break his word. That's your part, yeah? Like that, that's your responsibility to not break your word. So who would you want to make an agreement with in this situation? Somebody that says, well, as long as I don't make a vow to Jehovah, you know, I, it's just a, a, I don't have to make a vow to Jehovah, but I'll keep my word, you know? Like cross my fingers behind my back. You ever see kids do that? Like, and my kids, they still don't. They don't do that yet, but <laughs> hopefully they don't pick up that habit. All right, well, who would you want to make an agreement with? Somebody that emphasizes the part of keeping your word or who, who they should or should not make a vow to? You know, I mean, that's, that's very important, which the Pharisees, they were bending this around. So you have to recognize that if you're living in such a way to follow Jesus, you don't have to swear by anybody. You don't have to make these oaths. You don't have to do that. And what's amazing is you, we, people get in these predicaments, okay, in these situations that... Um, you know, like a lot of decisions. I always say life is made up of a lot of small decisions, yeah? And, like, sometimes they go bad. Sometimes you make the wrong ones. But if you're making a lot of small decisions that are developing a lifestyle or a set of, or a character that is proving you to be untrustworthy or, you know, maybe you, some people don't want to enter an agreement with you, that's not a good foundation, yeah? Like, that's just not where we're at. But if you're following Jesus, you have no choice but to be considerate of others, right? But put your, be uh, humble, right? Humility, serve others. Do what I say, do nothing out of selfish ambition. Yeah, I mean, that's just, that's a big part of it. So put a check mark or put a hold next to the small decisions because um, I know some of y'all, anybody watch the judge shows on TV? Like, what's your favorite? Throw them out there. Like, what is it? What do you got? People's Court. Court? Yeah, who's somebody, somebody said Judge Judy? Yeah, yeah, my, my, uh, my wife, she watches, what's the one with the three judges all the time? Uh, come on, anybody? What is it? Come on. Hot bench, yeah. Like, my wife, like, every time she comes home, she's got to turn that, those two on. I'm like, here we go. Like, it's this hour. And then she always finds Judge Judy at, like, 9 o'clock on a Saturday night. I'm like, how do you find this stuff, you know? So, anyways, Judge Judy's one I happen to see a lot of. And don't you ever look and see, like, somebody's always got, like, a shirt they just unwrapped, you know, like it's, just, it's still got the crease here and down and like in the arms. You know what I'm talking about, right? But sometimes, a lot of times, and here's the irony of the whole thing, they always got a, they got a cross on, right? Somebody's wearing a cross somewhere or maybe they got a tattoo of a cross or something, you know? And here's the, usually they're the defendant, aren't they? <laughs> right? Like usually they're the one going, man, like I got to They're invoking some kind of credibility by wearing this cross and like actually buying a nice shirt, Right? And, and they're trying to invoke some kind of character, which they truly have never been to begin with, yeah? I mean, you wouldn't have a creased up, nice button-down shirt. You would have had, had one already. Right? I mean, anyway, I'm not complimenting it. I'm not saying anything about anybody's dress, Andrew. But I am saying, <laughs> but I am saying, no, that, like, you can't just try to invoke God by wearing a cross or trying to look nice for the part, which a person you're really not, yes? Like, we see through that. Let's just be honest. So, um, what... And, and moving on, though, like keeping oaths is for special times, though, okay? So I have read in a lot of places, and there's actually some really popular uh, pastors out there that read this whole oath-keeping section uh, as don't take an oath at all, okay? Don't, don't, don't swear by an oath at all, okay? And that's not the way Jesus was intending this in this context. I just want to get this clear, and that Jesus was basically saying, look, you're going to mess up. You're a mess. You probably don't want to take an oath anyways. You're just making it worse for yourself because you really need to answer to God for this oath that you're making. You're swearing by God and just throwing it away by uh, these oaths you're making. Uh, the definition of an oath is to make a promise using God as your witness. Also, too, the Bible supports us taking oaths, okay? Uh, Romans 1.9. This is Paul. Romans 1.9. Uh, Paul says, God is my witness. Philippians 1.8, for God is my witness. First Thessalonians 2.5, God is our witness. Those are oaths. He's invoking God to say, this is what, this, God is my witness for me to do this action. God's going to watch me. Here's my responsibility. Yes? Like, that's, that's an oath. That's what we do. A lot of us, here, here's an oath I remember very well. I don't have it memorized because it's been a long time. But uh, some of y'all might remember this. I, Scott, do solemnly swear to affirm that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. I took that oath when I was enlisted in the Air Force, yeah? And how does it end? Does anybody remember how it ends? 
So help me God. I heard somebody say it. Yep, so help me God, right? You're invoking an oath to lay down your life for your country, to sacrifice for the Constitution of the United States and the leadership to do and send you into battle. Because I remember going there like, man, we're going to send you into harm's way. That's what they used to tell us all the time. Like, oh, really? But I swore to God. I swore to God. And if you're not a believer in God, then that, maybe that doesn't mean anything to you. But man, but what happens when you don't follow through on that oath? You get a dishonorable discharge. And let me go ask somebody who's got a dishonorable how hard it is to get a job in our society. It is not easy at all to get a job. Let me tell you that. Not only that, but now you have to answer to God that you broke that oath as well, which that's coming, you know? So some of us also took this oath. I, so-and-so, take you, so-and-so, to be my wife or husband, to have and to hold, for better or worse, right? Like, we all, we all probably said those vows, unless you can't with something similar to your own, but we always, I always said, in the presence of God, I make this vow, right? That's how it ended. We always swore to God, like I always, every wedding I've ever been to or attended, even my own wedding, we swore to God that we would go through life together no matter what. Yes? That's an oath. Yeah. So, um... You know, and I, and I know, like, we're going to touch on some things here, but you made an oath to God, okay? And you have to trust in this oath keeping. You do. You have to trust in holding up your end of the bargain because you're also invoking God to hold up his end of the bargain, yeah? So we can, let's back up a bit here because I know, and I, and I, and I should have told you I was going to jump around a little bit. Jesus addresses two issues, lust and divorce, okay? And so, uh, on this issue of lust, let's, let's just knock that one out to get that out of the way, okay? Because Jesus was pretty serious about this whole thing about lust, and I believe it tends to lead to other issues, especially divorce is one of them, where somebody, you know, cheats or, like, lust is just a terrible thing. And, and Jesus was so serious about it that he said, right, he said to tear out your eye. But let me give you a sneak peek here. In Matthew 6, 22, it says, The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. Okay? So Paul also tells you to what? Guard your thoughts also. Okay? And this is 1 Corinthians 10. He says, you're, you're, it says, like, guard your thoughts. Right? Think about what you see, what you allow yourself to see, or what you seek out to view. Right? And we know there's a lot of issues with that as well. Like, what are you really looking at? What are you dwelling on? What are you staring at? Right? Like, look, I know. I, I'm a guy. <laughs> you know, I grew up. Like, I remember one of the first day I saw my wife, we all had BDUs on. I don't know if you all know what those are, but we all had the same camo, polyester, stiff clothes on. We all looked the same, but I don't know, for some reason, my wife looked really good, and she looked really good in those clothes, and I was like, man, who is that, right? And so I, that's another story for another day. But anyways, but, you know, she, she caught my eye, and I got to know her and get to talk to her, right? So verse 29 uh, in Matthew 5, it says, if your right eye causes you to sin... Tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members that your whole body be thrown into hell. Do you see how serious Jesus is about lust? Yes? So you're probably like me, because if I was sitting there and I was, some dude was up here telling me, like, what do you mean? I can't control what I think about. I can't control what I see. Like, these, like, women, they look good. Like, oh, look how they're dressing, right? Like, you know, there's no modesty anymore. We see a lot of things going on. Like, I can't control that. That right there... That lack of control, and I actually challenged my Bible group with this, to really ponder the depth of your sin, to see how uncontrollable it is, and to see how Jesus is so serious about it, like, I can't control that. I can't control what I think. I need Jesus. That's where we should be. That's where we should arrive. That's pointing to you to go, man, you're so sinful, you don't even recognize how sinful you are, right? And you might be going, well, you know, it's not that bad. I'm just looking. Right? If I were to tell my wife something like that, she'd be like, you're just, what do you mean you're just looking? I got something for you to look at right here, right? Like, go ahead. Some of y'all go tell you how your wife, well, I was just looking, right? And see how that goes. So you're going to be sleeping on the floor or something or the couch probably, <laughs> right? So, I know, I get it. And I'm, I, I had to arrive at this all myself too when I was studying through this. I was like, man, and I realized how the depth that I needed Jesus. Um, uh, picking up at verse 31 and 32, Jesus addresses this whole issue of divorce, okay? Um, because what was happening in the day was, again, the, the, the Pharisees were leading the other Jewish men to find loopholes in the law. 
that, to find ways. And divorce was a big thing that they were doing. Um, you know, I, I talked about Malachi like some months back, if y'all were here. I always get divorced, Andrew. What's up with that? Anyways, so and, uh, they, were, he, they were leading other men through divorce. And we know through Malachi that God, God hates divorce, okay? But they were finding ways, again, to bend the Bible to their life. To, to, to their will, to their sinful desires. And that's not cool. It's showing them and it's exposing to them that their heart is an issue, okay? So I'm gonna read this verse and I want you to t- like, think about what you hear. Remember, we're being honest here. If, y'all are, if, you, or if you're a one or two on the honesty scale, I hope God confronts you and you're eight or nine right now. I mean, really. So I want you to listen to this Because I know we've got some divorced people uh, probably listening to this, or they're here. Um, So, verse 32. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. What did you hear? Did you hear the out? Did you hear the... Jesus, these are Jesus' words right here. They're in red in my Bible. It says, except on the ground of sexual immorality. Doesn't that provide an outlet for you? Doesn't that make you go, well, you know what? That, that, that SOB cheated on me. You don't know how bad he was, right? He left. Like, Jesus is saying, I can, you know, except on the ground of divorce, right? Well, I got something for you, okay? If you've ever read a lot of the Old Testament, God equates Israel as a cheating spouse, Yes? I believe in Jeremiah, there's certain parts that he's very harsh where he uses the word whore. Okay? And so there are some places where God didn't divorce us. And aren't we glad for that? God said, you know what? You're doing this. You're cheating on me. You're like a cheating spouse, but I'm still going to love you. I'm still going to do a work. I'm still going to send Jesus down to do what he did for a great sacrifice. Yes? Because that's God's heart, that no matter what we put him through, right, like, while we were still sinners, God loved us, that no matter what we put him through, he still loves us, and he's still available to us. So if we're checking our heart here, and we're going, man, Jesus provided it out, maybe I should still be faithful to this oath I made. Even though the other person didn't live up to their end of the bargain, me and God will, Yeah? And I know this is hard because I have actually tried to apply this in my own life. I'm like, if my wife cheats on me, it'd be devastating. If she wanted a divorce, devastating. But I want to be a man of my word. I want to follow God. And my wife knows I am following God first in my relationship and everything I do in my life, being a father, everything is becoming a follower of God first. And the oaths that I make to God, I need to live up to those first, yes? Because he's faithful. He is. He is faithful. But I want to show you this because I know some of y'all read this and hopefully this provides a new spin on this. Uh, In Proverbs it says, if your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For you will heap burning coals on his head and the Lord will reward you. A a divorcing spouse, a cheating spouse feels like an enemy, right? I I already gave you cases where, where God even kind of equated that almost as a cheating spouse. But Man, the last thing they're going to expect is what? For you to love them, for you to respect them, for you to pray for them. Yeah, I mean, that's hard. I totally get it. I totally get it. It's really hard, but this is what God is asking us to do, to be faithful. And being faithful is never, it's, I'm not going to say it's never going to be easy, but nine times out of ten, is not easy. Yeah? I mean, just being faithful through that. But also, if you're struggling to see how we are supposed to act through a lot of these situations and circumstances that we're going to have in life, go back to the beginning of Matthew 5. Look at Matthew 5, 5, or 5, 7, 5, 9, like, right? Like, blessed are the peacekeepers, right? Or uh, blessed are those who, uh, you know, are mourn, right? Like, all those things God is saying. Like, you're blessed. You're blessed going through these life situations and staying faithful. Um, here, look at 2 Timothy 2, verse 11. The saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. But this is the good part. If we are faithless, he is faithful, for he cannot deny himself. God is going to be faithful to you 
even if that other person is faithless or is denying God, when you remain faithful, God remains faithful with you, even maybe if our faith starts to slip as well, yeah? It even says it right there, even if we are faithless. God's still going to remain faithful. So God's got you on this. God has got you on this. So you just got to remain faithful and go through the hard times. Um, so God wants you to be faithful in your broken decisions, yeah? And coming back, so remember I said, like, put a mark in the small decisions, okay? In the small decisions, because rounding this off is to be a principled follower of Jesus, okay? Have some principles, yeah? Uh, verse 37, let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. I love the way James even puts this in James 5.12, but above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no so that you may not fall under condemnation. Look, be a person that knows where you stand on things. Yeah? I mean, there's not, that's, that shouldn't be hard for us. Okay? Be a person that goes, like, I know me and Andrew, we have this relationship, and Andrew will ask me, hey, dude, you want to go do this? He knows if I say no, it's because I've got something going on. It's not because I just want to sit on the couch, yeah? I was just at Matt's house yesterday, and man, I wanted to sleep in so bad yesterday, and I wanted to hang out and sit on the couch, but I didn't. I showed up at his house. We helped put his home gym together and do some other things, right? Like, how many, how many people like asking somebody to do something, and they're always getting to no? know? I don't see any hands in it, right? Like, I mean, I know, Andrew, you get it a lot, right? I mean, being a pastor, you got to, like, the word no is just an expectation. I'm like, oh, they're going to say no, right? But you keep asking no. You keep asking because here's the deal, yeah? And, and, and you know that maybe they're saying no because they're living in that, you know, that one and two range. Or, you know, they're like, they're, they're being seven out of ten honest with you, man. And like that eight or nine or ten, like, no, I don't want to help that dude move, you know. Right? Like, people ask you to move. Like, who, honestly, who likes moving in here? I don't see any hands in that one. No? Somebody say no, yes. If you like moving, we got, man, we got a ministry for you. Oh, okay. Anyway, so nobody likes moving, but yet people ask, you need help, right? Like, you show up, Yeah? I mean, that's just another thing. So, uh, you know, be a person that says yes or no, but let me say this. Your, your level of honesty, maybe your, your no is because you don't know or you're afraid or you're lazy or, uh, <laughs> you know, you got something going on, right? I mean, like, I'll admit, you know, people, they do think they do got some things going on, but maybe your no is keeping you from something greater than, you know? Like, God really didn't do much in people's lives by them saying no. It's always a yes. Like, I could say for sure in my life, like, when I started to say, yes, I'll go show up to this, or yes, I'll do that, or yes, I'll help with this, God did something different in that, where it wasn't just moving furniture into somebody's house. Like, it developed a relationship with people, yeah, or like, or other things came from that, yeah? I mean, God works in that, so you got to lay down your three, whatever's left on your scale. Hopefully you're at a seven in here. Everybody's at a seven, right? If you're a 10 out of 10, I'd love to meet you afterwards. Um, but, you know, hopefully you lay that down, okay? And you recognize that a yes, man, a yes could be a game changer for you. A yes could be life changing for you. Man, oh, I think it was what, just two weeks ago, my sister, she went back in the, uh, the kids area. <laughs> oh, you were in the preschool, right? The preschool, my sister, like, if you all know my sister, you're like, what? No way, right? But that was a yes. God works in that. Sorry, I didn't mean to call you. I put you on the spot. I put mom on the spot, so I figured I'd call you in too. Um, so anyways, so yeah, you shouldn't have gave me the microphone today. Anyways, so here's your application. So that way I can, I can, if you haven't found anything to take away from this yet, here's what I want you to hopefully take away from this. Because I'm excited that people are going to get baptized. I think that's going to be the awesomest thing in the world that we do here today. And me just running my mouth, I don't know. Anyway, so... Starting today, ask yourself, where are you at on this scale? And why can't you be 10 out of 10 honest? Find a loved one. Find somebody you trust. Find somebody in the church that you know and go be 10 out of 10 honest with them. Come to celebrate recovery. We're always 10 out of 10 honest in there. And man, it hurts sometimes, but you know what? It's healthy. It, he, there's a lot of times I leave here healed, right? I leave here, what does Jesus say about the truth? That it will set you free. Yeah, man, it's great to be able to just be transparent and honest, you know, and it's helping other people too. So be, find that. You have to recognize that what's keeping you from being a 10 out of 10 honest is maybe you don't recognize the magnitude that Jesus died for your sins. 
Yeah? Jesus died for all the stuff that you're hiding or you're keeping from somebody and that he already knows what you did, yeah? So what are those issues that lie in there and let God confront you in them? Uh, application two is that Paul uh, writes in Colossians that we, that we may live a life worthy of the Lord, okay? So if you're living this life of following Jesus and striving to live a life worthy of the Lord and his sacrifice that he made for us and his love and his place that he went to go and make for us, that you won't have a problem deciding whether yes or no is the right answer when people ask you to do things. People will know. Like You don't need to take this oath. Look, I swear to God, I, I can't come help you today. You won't be saying nothing like that. I used to say stuff like that. That used to be on my lips. Back in the day when I was a one and two, right? I used to say stuff like, now I don't because people know or I strive myself to be a principled follower of Jesus that somebody goes, hey, you want to help out with this, right? I, I imagine, no, yes or no, right? Yes, I will. Yes, I can. So, um, again, let your yes be yes and your no be no with purpose. But don't be afraid to explore a yes, all right? Don't be afraid to explore a yes you'll see it's just next time somebody asks you to do something Andrew's got a whole sheet of serving opportunities I'm just kidding (laughs) but next time somebody asks you like hey you want to help out with this or maybe you want to do this don't be afraid to come check it out I know we invite people all the time to celebrate recovery yeah just come listen come check it out come meet we invite people to church a lot of times I know that that can get scary for a lot of people maybe we got to ease them in here and there but hey you know don't be afraid to, to, to give a yes man Because yes, honestly, me saying yes is what got me right here. Some of y'all, if you knew me, me preaching God's word is huge because I never feel worthy to come up here and say any of God's word. But yet the fact that I said yes, God grew me through that. So, all right, so let's pray. And then, yeah, man, I can't wait. I can't wait. We're going to baptize. Let me pray and then we'll, we'll go.